Hi, everybody. This is Andy Ellicott from Swarm64. Thank you for joining us today to learn about building a modern data warehouse on FPGA accelerated Postgres. Our agenda this afternoon, <clears throat> excuse me, is uh, really about um, uh, migrating uh, from expensive proprietary data warehousing platforms to open source um, technologies. And well, one of the key enablers of that is FPGA acceleration, with which some of you may already be familiar, but if you're not, we will uh, wade into those waters with you and help you understand what FPGA acceleration is all about. Um, so we'll uh, we'll start with uh, just the topic of open source data warehousing, uh, why people are uh, thinking about doing that if they're not on it already. And then we'll get into the technology specifically. I'll turn things over to my colleague, uh, Sebastian Dressler, our head of solution engineering, who will uh, talk about how it all works, go through some of the, uh, the difference it can make in terms of database performance benchmarks, give you a few ideas on uh, reference architectures for different scenarios, and finally, kind of how to get started with it. We will have a Q&A session at the end. If you have questions as we go along, please type them into the questions panel and go to webinar there. And because it tends to be one of the most commonly asked questions, Yes, the uh, the event will be recorded and shared with you along with the slides after the event. We'll send you a, an email with uh, links to both of those things. So for those of you who are who may not have, be familiar with Swarm 64, we are a um, company based in Berlin and uh, Boston, Massachusetts area that really we're uh, we develop ways for Postgres to go faster, right? So, a uh, bunch of parallel processing experts, uh, hardware, hardware level developers, um, you know, working on uh, really unique ways to get Postgres to deliver better uh, query performance, insertion performance, and, and many other aspects to make it uh, very competitive with uh, some of the other top databases in the world. Okay, so uh, when we talk about data warehousing and open source for data warehousing, you know, it's really for a lot of you uh, data warehouse architects, right, database architects out there. It's it's kind of a, a heroic opportunity for you, right? Really to save um, you know millions of dollars in IT costs every year being spent on uh, proprietary data warehousing platforms that are probably getting pretty old by now. Things like Netiza, uh, Oracle, uh, and others, and replace those with free open source. Uh, platform to save a massive amount of money and uh, be open and make hiring experts to administer and architect solutions on those platforms a lot easier. And if that's what you're thinking, you're not alone. Uh, you may have, uh, if you're following Gartner Research at all, uh, you may have seen in their state of open source data report last October, uh, they had some really interesting forecasts, uh, which include uh, two relevant facts today. And one of the reasons why we see a lot of open source data modernization initiatives within enterprises we talk to, uh, about 70, they predict that within two years, 70% of all new data projects will be running on open source databases. And 50% of the database applications and systems we see today will be uh, migrated to open source as well. So, um, you know, kind of happy, hunting, moving uh, uh, all those uh, systems onto open source databases. And if you're a follower of Postgres, you're probably well aware that it's uh, one of the most popular open source databases there is, right up there with MySQL, top two uh, most popularly used. And um, I think for database architects, one of their prime targets for migration or replacement or just uh, you know kind of um, end of lifing are some of the platforms you see here. Right. They tend to be the biggest and most expensive in any IT department. Uh, annual maintenance on any of, you know, an Ateza rack or Teradata or Exadata can uh, usually starts around or above $250,000 a year. So being able to eliminate that cost for, you know, 10, 25, 50, we see some, in some very large corporations, almost, uh, you know, 100 data warehouse appliances like these uh, installed. So being able to eliminate those from the data center, um, place them with modern architecture, or just move those workloads to the cloud, um, 
you know, is and save all that money is a huge economic opportunity and a way to escape you know, kind of proprietary lock-in that, that users of these platforms experience today. The solution we're going to be talking about is uh, combines the three following components. Right? So number one, free open source Postgres. No fork, no commercial version of it, just Postgres. Right? Uh, although we can accelerate commercial forks of Postgres, like at Enterprise DB. Uh, but along with that is the Swarm 64 um, FPGA extensions for Postgres, okay, which uh, in, uh, work with free open source Postgres. And what they introduced into Postgres are the following of uh, parallel, a higher degree of parallel processing, especially in query execution, uh, columnar indexing, which helps speed up uh, data retrieval and reduce I.O. And, um, and then FPGA acceleration, being able to run a lot of the query and insertion logic on a uh, hardware accelerator like at the FPGA, um, Xilinx or Intel, and, um, and allow the CPUs to keep working on transactions and whatever else they're busy doing. So really um, um, kind of spread the, the work around the computer and, and leverage the extra processing power that's introduced with the FPGA processor. Okay, so uh, first a quick primer on FPGA, right? So uh, in a nutshell with the Swarm 64 software running on the FPGA, it's like adding 100, <clears throat> 100 cores to your database server, okay? So it's a very easy, way, uh, affordable way to add a lot of parallel processing to your server, much easier than you know scaling out on multiple nodes uh, or moving from you know kind of a server with n cores to a bigger server with you know you know n n x cores you know some multiple of that and um, fpgas are essentially uh, it stands for field programmable data array it's an integrated circuit that you drop into your server or that you provision in the cloud uh, if you're familiar with the amazon f1 server that's a, a fpga equipped instance on amazon both cases running as iLynx um, uh, FPGA. Um, but what makes the FPGA unique is, uh, is that the firmware that instructs it what to do can be changed at runtime, right? So with Swarm 64, when you start up Postgres with the Swarm 64 extension in it, uh, Swarm 64 will put a uh, software image onto the FPGA at startup that um, executes at near pretty much firmware speed uh, and supplements the CPU. And it, in the case of uh, Swarm 64, we start up about 100 or so individual processes that work in parallel together, uh, reading and filtering and compressing and decompressing and scanning data so that you're um, just adding a whole bunch of more parallelism to Postgres. Okay. Uh, some facts related about uh, FPGA acceleration of databases. Some of you who've been uh, in the data warehouse space for a while are probably familiar with the concept through the Natiza Data Warehouse Appliance, which was introduced around 15 years ago. Uh, they're the company that really coined the expression data warehouse appliance. And inside their appliance were a bunch of uh, servers, that were FPGA equipped and really it was FPGA accelerated Postgres, right? And um, that's what's inside Natiza. And uh, today we're talking about, you know, kind of almost like a DIY Natiza, uh, where you're you're doing that yourself, except on standard Postgres. Over the last 10 years, uh, FPGAs have become around 500 times more powerful than they were when you may have maybe installed the uh, the Natizas that are running in your uh, your data centers, and they've outpaced CPUs in terms of um, power gains or uh, sort of performance gains as well. So it's a great um, piece of hardware to drop into the, your database servers and your data centers or to leverage in the cloud. Uh, more recently, so the idea of um, you know applying FPGA to database performance isn't unique to Natiza and Swarm 64 for Postgres. Uh, AWS or Amazon announced li late last year that uh, Redshift, actually, they're using FPGA to accelerate Redshift as well. So 
FPGA acceleration for databases could be the big you know, performance thing for databases this year with um, you know, increasing number of databases uh, building support for it. And um, as I mentioned before, FPGAs are very accessible to people. You don't uh, require FPGA programming skills to leverage them to speed up your database. Companies like Swarm64 have done that for you. Uh, and as I mentioned, you can find FPGA instances on Amazon, I think soon on Azure and uh, on other cloud platforms like I think Alibaba and Baidu also support them today. Okay, so what we're really gonna talk about, I'm gonna turn things over to Sebastian to go into more technical detail, but essentially it's um, you know doing what this cabinet of Natiza can do, except with uh, 2U, you know, kind of form factor server uh, running free open source Postgres accelerated on FPGA uh, with the Swarm FPGA extension, and you essentially get the same performance as a Natiza or Oracle Data Warehouse uh, for about 20% of the cost. So huge savings opportunity for you. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Sebastian to uh, educate you more deeply on the technology. Sebastian. Thanks, Andy. Right, so let's look a bit deeper into what we basically provide you. And I would basically start with a general overview of how things are working and how they fit together. So uh, yeah, let's get it started. So basically, as Andy said, we are not forking Postgres by any means, we are extending it. So essentially all you have to do is calling uh, create extension with our SO loaded, and then we are basically hooking into Postgres. And on that, we perform a multitude of things. So there are basically two sides. One side is a software extension side only, and the, on the other hand, we have more um, hardware-driven features. And uh, for the software extension, we basically provide you uh, optimizations to the Postgres Query Planner for instance, to keep your plans more parallel throughout the end of execution, which is normally not the case with Postgres uh, occasionally, especially if you're doing group buys and order buys. So we're changing that. And as, aside from that, we are also increasing the parallelism you can apply. And basically by that leveraging your multi-core servers. So let's imagine you have a server with quite a lot of uh, CPU course in and you're running only a single query then what you will typically see with postgres is that the amount of cores that are actually used is rather limited typically up to 12 something like that and we are changing that so you can make use of all cores and this also then helps even in uh, multi-user scenarios where you typically don't have to change the configuration and just can basically keep running. So it's like built-in uh, management system into Postgres, essentially. Um, now, on the hardware side, what we provide is a specific storage for um, what we call uh, swarm tables. And that storage is then backed by the FPGA. So the moment you use a, a swarm table, which is essentially nothing different than um, we are using the foreign data wrapper interface here. So you do not do create table typically, but you call create foreign table and give it some definitions. And then by that, your table is backed by the FPGA and you can then accelerate your queries much faster. And all those tables, whenever you query them, they are passed through the FPGA and then certain statements of the query is pushed down to that and basically it frees up your CPU. We will look later into an example of how a query is executed on the FPGA and which parts are um, pushed down exactly. And that's actually on the next slide, Andy. So here in that example, we are taking a single query. It is actually the TPCH query number six you're seeing here and we dissected it a bit. So at the very beginning, you always start with a parallel plan because that's what Postgres just does with any query. It creates a plan for you and that plan is then executed eventually. 
Now, what we do first is we have to fetch data, obviously. And that's also no difference from a, let's say, normal query you would want to execute. But in our case, we are not providing you any indexes you have to create yourself, but the indexes are built into the table essentially, and we call this optimized columns. So you see this here as this uh, nice drawing where it says optimized columns and there is the line item table of TPCH underneath. And basically you can think of optimized columns as a range-based index. So the moment you start a query and you're using that optimized column, it will do a coarse grain selection onto the blocks you're needing. Now the optimized column have the nice benefit that your data is actually aligned across the domain dimensions you define. And therefore you get a very efficient IO pattern. Basically you can stream the data through um, instead of let's say typical scatter gather access patterns you would maybe normally see with traditional indexes. And then for every block you fetch, these are immediately passed to the hardware accelerator. And this consists of multiple stages. The first stage is the decompression stage. So basically we also store the data in a compressed manner. In the field, you get typically up to two X or three X on compressions. We have seen more than that, like up to five X. That depends a bit on the data set you're using. So it first gets compressed. And then we essentially push down the select statement to the hardware accelerator and that then uh, understands which uh, columns you want. And those columns are pre-selected. And if you, let's say, need more columns from a following filter query, then those are also taken into account, obviously. Uh, after the column picker, it's passed on and then we do the uh, fine grain filtering. So remember we are potentially overfetching blocks from the optimized columns. And then we push them down through the FPGA as, it, as the data flows. And here they are uh, filtered completely so that only that is passed back what you really wanted in the end. And in that case here, you have this complete end chain pushed down and um, the data is then passed back. Now this remainder of the data is then held in RAM and essentially uh, further processed by the CPU for finalization. So in that case of query number six, the CPU has to do the sum over those two columns, extended price and discount. And then after that step, you have your result and the result is then materialized and passed back to the user interface which could be anything that is compatible with Postgres, may it be a JDBC connector or simply your console. Now, how does that look in comparison with Postgres? We will see that on the next slide. We prepared a little video for you. And what you see on that video is essentially a split screen. So you have on the left side, Swarm, accelerated Postgres. On the right side is Postgres native. And we just run the queries and as you see, we are done within 10 seconds and the result is the same because we speeded that video up a bit. So you see on the right hand side, the native process was done within 800 seconds, which is um, quite a nice speed up, I would say. So that is how it looks in reality. So we have a speed up of roughly 90 here and it's a very effective um, query uh, execution. Now, um, let's look a bit more into FPGA technology. Next slide, please. So essentially what Andy already said is this is a programmable gate array. So you can change the core logic that is on the device. And what it enables you is that you can also change the logic during processing, which then enables you in turn to drive different patterns onto your device. And by that, you can offload many more things from the CPU. So on the next slide, we see two different patterns we could think of. And um, so imagine you have a um, pattern during the night, which is very write heavy, but your device is typically configured as a very, um, for, for more read operations. 
meaning that your write operations will obviously take longer. Now, what you could do with the reprogrammability of the FPGA, you could go ahead and be right before your nightly workload kicks off, you just reprogram the device. You don't have to change it for that, but you can just apply a different image. And by that action, which will take you a few seconds, you are essentially switching down, uh, you're switching to a more write heavy profile. And by that, you are shrinking in time and increasing the throughput for, of your writes. Now, if you're at the end of the night and all your updates and your inserts are done, you just switch back. Again, it takes you a few seconds. And then you can use your daily read heavy workload and this enables a multitude of possibilities obviously because you can also have multiple different FPGA images for instance such that are optimized to uh, to do text search geospatial operations or even json processing or also time series and basically by that we enable you to specialize the accelerator and you can keep your database management system, which, are used, which you, you are used to. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, now, we prepared a little, some benchmarks here, and I will just walk you through those slides. We will start with the traditional data warehouse benchmark, which is a TPCH in our case. And uh, we've chosen TPCH because there is, um, quite a lot of um, material available for comparison so as you probably know there's also tpcds but for tpcds there are not that many results and so typically people are going with tpch and what we did here is we compared ourselves to Greenplum with in the specification of tpch which means that you run seven streams in parallel for um, making a throughput test and that is shown on the left hand side here in that graph so running seven streams for and for those seven streams nine queries that complete we take around 700 1700 seconds and green plum 4.2 takes 5200 seconds in that case which is roughly a 3x speed up we are achieving here now in terms of tco this is also a 3x reduction if you compare uh, our solution in this case on a amazon f1 instance versus screen plum also on a amazon instance which is a uh, r5 24x large here in that case and we were testing one terabyte worth of data so essentially 3x speed up 3x tco decrease i think that boils down quite nicely now on the next slide uh, before i advance just to uh clarify the <clears throat> reason why only nine queries were executed instead of the full 22 is that um, I think there was something like uh, um, Green Plum wasn't able to execute uh, all of those. I think just what, 11 or nine of them, 11. Um, and Swarm 64 by contrast was able to execute uh, 20 of the 22 without timing out. Right, thanks Andy, thanks for yeah. adding. So on the next slide, we see a more, um, POC-like case, which we did together with a healthcare company in the US, they have around 10 terabytes of data. And this is the classical Netiza replacement. So they were using a Netiza appliance beforehand. And uh, after having, after the end of life of that appliance, they were looking for alternatives. And we are one of the alternatives, and, and basically we were testing two different query sets. Number one is a very scan-heavy query set, and here you can see that we beat Netiza by far on that with our technology and our improvements to Postgres. And on the other hand, we have a set that is very much optimized for Netiza, trying to use um, every bit of the technology provided and we are quite good on par with that so um, I think the worst example here is query number five with quite some speed difference five seconds versus 0 0.6 but without any further optimizations this is a very good result I would say and uh, I, 
for the Netiza users amongst you, I think you are fully aware of the TCO in that case. So there is no uh, need to cite that more. And what we also enable you, and we showed it on the next slide, is that you can do hybrid cases with our technology. So in this case, we have here a um, so-called HTAP case, which is a term coined by Gartner, combining essentially analytics and transactional processing queries. And we we are we we are using trading data here in that case, which is provided by a company in the US. You can download that for free. And then we basically started to ingest the data as fast as we could. And we went here to a top ingestion rate of 200,000 transactions per second into the system, while at the same time being able to query the last uh, parts of the data that were ingested and essentially keeping up with every new inflowing data. And on the same time, at the same time also analyzing this data and here in that specific case making trading recommendations in order to tell the potential user whether there is a specific piece of stock he or she should sell or buy and as you can see in the graph the um, uh, key metrics here are the trading runtime and the, underneath of that the transformation runtime and, the, and both of them are within limits now for comparison if you would do this with plain postgres the um, trading runtime would blow up over time and basically destroy the real time aspect here now how did we manage to achieve that we see that on the next slide and essentially this is what we call the HTTP reference architecture and the key here is that we are staying on a single instance of Postgres. We are extending it with Swarm, of course, but we are splitting the tables into two pieces. So we have one on the one side transactional tables, and on the other side, we have analytical tables. And both of them are backed by different technologies. The transactional tables are backed by Intel Optane DC in that case which is a very low latency um, persistent memory. And you can achieve the same effect essentially with other low latency storage. Um, in that case, Obtain DC was, was a very good choice because we could simply move the write ahead lock of Postgres onto this part of the memory while keeping persistence. But we can also then keep the uh, normal storage you have like SSDs, or even network attached storage, you can keep that completely for analytical tables and also for the majority of your data, which is not affected by um, latencies of the write ahead lock. Now, in order to recombine the two tables again, we deployed a continuous transformation. So with every new item of data, with every new row that comes in, we basically batch these up and transform, transform them into analytical tables. You can, of course, already do some pre-selection here of the most interesting metrics, but you could also transform the complete data and then run your analytics on top. And based on that architecture, you then can define update parameters, which are accessing the analytical tables, preferably directly within SQL, because that's closest to the database, but also any other language would work. And then you essentially, based on those parameters, can start making decisions. And this is obviously a repeated process. So it never stops. You can access your analytics the last few seconds you just got in terms of fresh data. Or you can also go further and access more historical data. But you essentially uh, combine both worlds together here. And the importance here is that we are making use of both technologies uh, of Postgres with its native tables and of FPGA backed swarm tables. Next slide. Thank you. So, um, in terms of deployment options, we basically are more talking about a complete ecosystem as of now. So, as you know, uh, Postgres is 
more than just a database. It's some people even call it the database framework and we're just making use of that. And on the next slide, you will see some possibilities you have today. So as Andy said, we are also accelerating EDB Postgres, which is the enterprise version of Postgres with support on top and certain functionalities to make your life in terms of moving from Oracle to Postgres easier. And then we have the uh, types of accelerators we support. And these are at the moment the Xilinx Avio Suite cards, which is a wide range of accelerator cards depending on your needs. We also support now Samsung Smart SSDs. This is the latest, greatest technology we are having in the portfolio. And we also have the Intel FPGA accelerator cards. And in terms of um, providers, there's of course the option to go with Amazon. We have options with OVH or the Nimix Cloud, we are on Azure. And in, you can of course also always go on-premise and um, you, there are also options to create appliance-like solutions, which we will see on the next slide. Where we have, for instance, uh, we can make use of the AMD Epic technology, which are, as you know, C uh, core CPUs with a high amount of cores, effectively pushing down complete racks into a small, into a very small form factor, giving you um, quite enormous processing power, and also the storage you might want to use in terms of hundreds of terabytes or even further. And these systems are supporting the uh, Xilinx U50 cards, which are small form factor cards, and you can create high density configurations with that. Next slide, please. And as said, we also are supporting the smart SSD drives from Samsung at the moment, which are really fresh. And here we are seeing really good numbers. So you can create your storage array with those drives. And the benefit here clearly is that the logic is configurable because it's an FPGA again, but the logic also sits next to your storage. So whatever you transfer from the storage into your, let's say, memory, for instance, doesn't need to go via any PCI Express bus first before it passes the FPGA and the logic therefore, but it can pass directly through the logic and that gives you a higher, high speed ups. So most notably we've experienced uh, up to 40 times faster on scans and also on the right side, it's up to 35 times faster. And the graph on the left side shows you essentially how many queries per hour you can push through in contrast when you are using Swarm on such a smart SSD or actually even a rate of smart SSDs if you want to increase storage versus the CPU only variant. Now, besides that, we are also having uh, certain scale out options we can go. These are on the next slide. So number one is a replication cluster. And this is essentially backed by PG pool two in that case. So you can um, essentially Essentially, you're copying your instances. So by that, you're getting load balanced reads because um, the FPGA technology essentially helps you to create these kind of high density systems supporting more users than native Postgres would do. And to then even support more users than that, you would use obviously load balancer. And in the case of Postgres, there's PG pool two which also can give you write replication and by that keeping your servers in sync. And it also has built-in failover. So when none, one node fails, then your queries are redirected to the next node. And that is a very well applicable uh, schema, especially also on Amazon F1, where we have that documented how you can set up such a cluster. Uh, the other option, is that you can extend Postgres with a open source patch, which we provide, uh, not Postgres itself, but a part of Postgres, which is the Postgres foreign data wrapper. 
And what our patch does is it changes the way it can process uh, queries. Normally it does it only in a sequential manner, but uh, the patch basically enables you to do it also um, by parallel processing. And what you can do with that is that you can use the partitions that are already built in into Postgres and connect the partitions to remote instances. And by that basically creating a scale out variant, which consists of a coordinator and uh, data nodes. And the interesting fact here is that the coordinator is essentially stateless, meaning it does not host the data, but the data nodes do have the data on. And by that you can then even spawn multiple coordinators and get some form of elasticity into your system. Um, and <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and essentially the same holds for the data nodes. So you can extend them uh, over time. You just have to manage your partitions properly. And in this case, the um, features which are built in into Postgres enable you to create a cluster without any involvement of third parties. Yeah, I think that was a quite technical deep dive and I'm handing back to Andy and Andy is going to tell you how you can get things started, Andy. Thank you, Sebastian. So if you're, um, if you're currently uh, beginning to migrate or uh, build data warehouses on open source platforms uh, like Postgres, uh, you know, we encourage you to uh, give uh, FPGA acceleration of thought and are help, happy to help you uh, try that out. Uh, again, the economic opportunities are, are quite large for everybody. And uh, the good next steps are to try it, right? So we can, um, happy to set up a conversation with you individually to see if, you know, uh, FPGA acceleration and Postgres are a good fit for your use cases. Uh, if you're using Postgres already, we accelerate Postgres versions 11 and 12, as, as well as the Enterprise DB um, version of Postgres. You can run it uh, on premises in your data center. Uh, we run on Xilinx and Intel FPGAs, and as uh, Sebastian just mentioned, uh, the Samsung smart SSDs, which are very interesting. And if you're uh, thinking of moving your data warehousing to the cloud, you want to kind of build and host your own to save money, and uh, you can uh, do that on the Amazon F1 instances. Uh, if you go to our uh, website, you can see a video of how to get started there from the Amazon Marketplace. It takes about five minutes to get your FPGA accelerated Postgres instance up and running on F1. Uh, we also offer, for those of you who are in advanced technology labs and uh, have different uh, database projects uh, teams coming to you uh, throughout the month, week, day, uh, asking uh, for recommendations on um, data platforms. Uh, if you're in that lab environment and you'd like a copy of Swarm to um, kind of do prototyping and uh, benchmarking on your own for all those projects without having to organize a proof of concept um, sort of a, a scenario every time. We offer the Swarm 64 DA lab license, which costs uh, around $550 a month. And that was uh, offered to all of you at half price for attending this webinar. Uh, but it's one you can use in uh, non-production environments on any uh, FPGA or hardware you want in the cloud or on-premises, uh, just so you have it on hand to um, to do quick and easy uh, prototyping of uh, FPGA accelerated Postgres for your various projects. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's uh, take some time now for a quick time for Q&A. I've got a few minutes left here. Uh, firstly, you can reach uh, Sebastian and I directly at Swarm64. Uh, also, our good friend Daniel Eaton over at Xilinx, who was able to attend today, um, can be reached with questions about um, FPGA uh, products specifically, the FPGA hardware. But let's start with some questions from people. Um, let me look here, go through them. Let's pick out some good ones. Um, 
One for you, Sebastian. Just any comments on data loading speed? You know, does the uh, FPGA uh, help accelerate that? Just kind of what? Yeah, uh, happy to take that. So essentially, because the compression and decompression is built into the FPGA, you're offloading that from the CPU, and you, you can just freely stream your data in throughout the FPGA. And uh, by that, we increase the amount of um, or the ingestion rate you can achieve. So in practice, for this uh, cited TPCH one terabyte benchmark, to load a complete data set, um, you will take with like all bells and whistles, especially like uh, creating, uh, analyzing the tables and loading data, obviously, it will take you roughly 15, 20 minutes. Whereas on native Postgres, this can take up to 24 hours depending on the machine. So that is clearly where the power of the PGA comes in. Thank you. Uh, another one for you. Uh, a uh, question about Netiza zone emaps, uh, which are internal data structures that enable FPGAs to filter out data. Does Swarm64 use a similar method? Yeah, that is essentially what uh, we talked earlier about the optimized columns. You can define up to three at the moment, and they are then creating some sort of dependent data structure, which helps you to access your data more efficiently. So the, um, a very good example is probably geospatial data where you have latitude and longitude. So you would define your optimized columns across these two dimensions. And then whenever you access them, the uh, optimized columns help you on the early data reduction. And then everything else is done within the FPGA in terms of filtering. So it's like it's quite similar to Netiza in that case, but the um, the optimized columns are outside the FPGA and uh, part of the filtering is inside. So as said earlier, the moment you create a table that is uh, backed by the FPGA, you are essentially using it as a streaming device and uh, getting the full benefits of it. Thank you. Um, let's see, we have like less than one minute left. Um, there was a question on pricing. Um, so we, uh, uh, Swarm 64. So we, uh, so as I mentioned before, Swarm 64 accelerates free open source Postgres. So uh, you, there's no charge for Postgres, of course. You uh, just run standard Postgres. The Swarm 64 FPGA accelerator, we charge based on the uh, small monthly um, amount based on per CPU. Uh, so, so essentially, based on the number of CPUs we're uh, we're accelerating in the in your server, and that's uh, usually at a minimum, it's 24, uh, 16, 24 CPUs in the um, in the servers we accelerate. Um, I think that brings us to quarter of. So, um, want to thank everybody for joining us today. I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions. Uh, we'll follow up uh, with the others um, afterwards. But I want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, Sebastian, thank you for sharing your knowledge once again. And we look forward to talking to all of you again in the future or seeing you in a future webinar. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot.